It's Tuesday. New proof of the Pythagorean theorem just dropped. I'm very excited today to share a new proof of the Pythagorean theorem. And in addition to it being cool, just that there's another proof of the Pythagorean theorem out there, this one is distinctive for two other reasons. First of all, it was discovered and presented by two high school students, Kelsey Johnson and Nakia Jackson at a regional meeting of the AMS. So that right there, super cool. Well done, ladies. But second of all, it is a trigonometric proof of the Pythagorean theorem. Generally speaking, pure trigonometric proofs of the Pythagorean theorem for a long time were not thought to be possible at all, because ultimately it was believed that any such proof would come to rely on what's called the Pythagorean identity, sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals one. As you might imagine, based on its name, the Pythagorean identity is derived from the Pythagorean theorem. So any trigonometric proof that ends up relying on the Pythagorean identity is implicitly a circular proof. Now, although for a long time, people said that there was no such proof possible. A little over a decade ago, Jason Zimba did in fact prove the Pythagorean theorem purely using trigonometry. I think he used the sum and difference identities to do it, which do not rely on the Pythagorean identity. Either way though, this is still super cool and I wanna get into it. The first thing that Johnson and Jackson did is they start with just your standard right triangle. Some right triangle with side lengths A and B, with hypotenuse length C, and then of course across from those side lengths we have angles, in this case complementary angles, that we're going to name alpha and beta. I'm not drawing it in here, but everything that looks like a right triangle in this picture is a right triangle. What we're going to try to do is to get to this statement right here. A squared plus B squared, of course, equals C squared, but equals C squared by way of this particular ratio, 2AB over sine 2 alpha. This essentially is going to come from the combination of our basic definition of the sine ratio and the law of sines itself, neither of which depends in any way on the Pythagorean identity. So for your basic sine ratio, of course we can say things like sine of alpha is equal to A over C. That is, the sine of some angle is equal to the ratio of the length of the side opposite that angle divided by the length of the hypotenuse. Similarly, we could also say sine of beta is equal to B over C. And in fact, that's the one that we really need a little bit more. So we're just gonna keep that up here. Sine beta equals B over C. But you might notice in this statement that we're aiming for, we have a two alpha, and there is no angle measure two alpha in this diagram right now. So Miss Johnson and Miss Jackson very cleverly reflected this right triangle across and got us that angle of two alpha. Now what that created was an isosceles triangle, no longer a right triangle, with a vertex angle two alpha, that's the one that we're going to need for this statement down here, and then base angles beta and beta. The angle two alpha was across from a side length of two A, and then each of the angles beta are now across from what was a moment ago, our hypotenuse length of C. If we express this in terms of the law of sines, we can say that sine of two alpha over two A is equal to sine of beta over C. Combining this with our piece of information from a moment ago, we can actually go ahead and substitute and say, well, we knew that sine beta was actually equal to B over C, and so with a bit more simplification, we can say that sine two alpha over two A is the same thing as B over C squared. If we divide both sides by B here and then use the reciprocal identity, flip everything upside down, what we're going to get is this statement right here. 2AB over sine two alpha is the same thing as C squared. So let's also store that piece of information over here for safekeeping. Now the question at this point should be, well, okay, that's great, but where does the A squared plus B squared get involved here? How on earth do we get that without the Pythagorean theorem itself? The answer that the high school students came up with, very clever, was to develop this shape they call the waffle cone. The waffle cone is a series of infinitely many similar right triangles to our original ABC right triangle. You can tell what that means is the waffle cone is itself a very large right triangle because it has these two complementary angles, alpha and beta, in that left-hand corner. Because it's a right triangle, we can make another statement about sine of two alpha. We can go back to our original sine ratio definition and say that sine of two alpha must be the same thing as U, this base of the larger right triangle, divided by V, the hypotenuse of that same right triangle. Meaning if we can figure out what the lengths are for U and V, we can restate what sine of two alpha is and hopefully connect it to this statement over here about C squared. 
Now, this is where the proof is no longer really purely trigonometric because the way that we're going to figure out these lengths, u and v, is we're going to take advantage of this infinite series of similar right triangles, and taking advantage of infinite series is really more of a calculus style thing to do, not really a trigonometric style thing to do. Again, all of these are similar. They all use the same alpha and beta angles, along with, of course, the right angle, and so all of their side lengths have to be in this ratio, a to b to c. But then in this first triangle right here, the larger leg, which in the original triangle was length b, has to be length 2a. So to get to that first triangle, we must be multiplying by a ratio 2a divided by b. The divided by b part is what cancels out b, and then of course the 2a is what gives us that length of 2a that we know it's equal to in this larger right triangle. Using that same ratio, that means that the smaller side must be 2a squared over b, and the hypotenuse must be 2ac over b. So if we wanted to, we could label that here, so that's 2ac over b, and again, of course, this side here is going to be 2a, and then the shorter side on that right triangle is going to be 2a squared over b. That shorter side, 2a squared over b, is actually the same as the longer side of the next triangle down. So we can now take this and put it in place of the longer leg, 2a, and to get from 2a to 2a squared over b, we can see we have changed the ratio. We're now multiplying by a over b. And in fact, that is the same ratio we're going to be using for all of these right triangles all the way toward, you know, the infinitely small tip of that larger right triangle. This means the next hypotenuse down is gonna be 2a squared c over b squared. That is that length right there, 2a squared c over b squared. And then the shorter side is going to be 2a squared over b times a over b. So that ends up being 2a cubed over b squared. But in fact, all we care about, all the way down on both sides, are hypotenuses. And now that we have the ratio we're going to use the entire time, we can skip ahead and only state those hypotenuse lengths. For example, this next hypotenuse down is 2a cubed c over b cubed. And then the one down after that is 2a to the fifth c over b to the fifth, because in each case, we're using two of the ratios to get to that next triangle down on the side that we care about. Similarly, this hypotenuse here is going to be 2a to the fourth c over b to the fourth, and this next one down will be 2a to the sixth c over b to the sixth, and so on and so on all the way down. This gives us a sum for both u and v. For u, for example, we can see it's 2ac over b plus 2a to the third c over b to the third plus 2a to the fifth c over b to the fifth, on and on forever. And that's a pure infinite series. We could rewrite that as the sum from one to infinity of 2ac over b, that is the initial term, times the ratio a squared over b squared to the n minus one power, because of course we don't use the ratio on the first term, but then we use it to get every subsequent term after that. Using the formula for the value of a convergent infinite series, we can say that u is equal to that initial value, 2ac over b, divided by one minus the ratio, a squared over b squared. If we multiply everything on top and bottom by b squared, we're going to get the statement that u is equal to 2abc over b squared minus a squared. And that's something that we will go ahead and store over here on the right. V is a little bit tougher to parse out because it does have this initial portion C that's not going to end up being part of our infinite series, but we'll deal with that in a second. We can say that V is equal to C plus 2A squared C over B squared plus 2A to the fourth C over B to the fourth plus 2A to the sixth C over B to the sixth on and on forever. So in fact, we can restate that as C plus the infinite series, again, from one to infinity of 2A squared C over B squared times A squared over B squared, that ratio just like before to the N minus one power. Using our same formula before, V equals C plus our initial value 2A squared C over B squared divided by one minus that same ratio, 
a squared over b squared. And just like before, we're going to multiply everything in that fraction by b squared over b squared to further simplify this into c plus 2a squared c over b squared minus a squared. Now this one unfortunately takes a little bit more simplification because we basically need to get a common denominator to combine the c plus the 2a squared c over b squared minus a squared. So another way to think about that is c times b squared minus a squared over itself, b squared minus a squared, plus that quantity 2a squared c over the same common denominator, b squared minus a squared. As we distribute that c on top, we get b squared c minus a squared c plus the 2a squared c that we had over here, all over the common denominator of b squared minus a squared. Well, negative a squared and positive 2a squared are like terms. So in fact, we can write v as a squared c plus b squared c, the a squared c coming from negative 1a squared c plus 2a squared c, all over b squared minus a squared. And then furthermore, we can factor out c, and we can say v is equal to c, times a squared plus b squared all over b squared minus a squared. And you should be getting excited because you can see we have an a squared plus b squared involved finally. Unsurprisingly, this is the last piece of information we need. So let's store this over here with our other series of amazing boxes. Uh, actually, that's going to be behind me. You're not even going to be able to see that anymore. I guess I'll just put it right there. All right, armed with all of this, let's remember where we're trying to go. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. At this point, I don't think we need sine of beta anymore, so we can get rid of that. But we do want to rewrite this sine of 2 alpha. We're going to say sine of 2 alpha is equal to u over v, where u is this expression here, 2abc over b squared minus a squared, and then the denominator v is this expression here, c times the quantity a squared plus b squared, also over b squared minus a squared. Because those use the same denominators, those denominators actually cancel out. For that matter, these c's cancel out here. And so you can tell that gives us a new statement for sine of 2 alpha. We can say sine 2 alpha is equal to 2ab over a squared plus b squared. With some fancy proportions, we could tell that's the same thing as saying 2ab over sine of 2 alpha is equal to a squared plus b squared, and that's what we needed. We have done it. We have shown that a squared plus b squared must be the same thing as 2ab over sine 2 alpha, must be the same thing as c squared itself. The Pythagorean theorem is proven. Don't worry, folks, it's definitely true. Again, just a really great job by Kelsey Johnson and Nakia Jackson, high school students from New Orleans who have proved the Pythagorean theorem, proved it in a mostly trigonometric way using your sine ratio definition and your law of sines theorem, neither of which depend on the Pythagorean identity. There was a little calculus thrown in there for good measure, but to me, that's all the better. They were just using tools across mathematics and they proved the Pythagorean theorem. What an amazing accomplishment for those two girls. You know I had to do it. I loaded this up into Desmos, so I've got a little thing that you can play with there. You get the UV labels, you get the angle labels. I will put the link to the Desmos graph in the description. I will also link to that Jason Zimba proof, that trigonometric proof of the Pythagorean theorem that came out a little over 10 years ago, along with some other trigonometric and infinite series style proofs that I found on the Cut the Knot website. So check out all those links in the description. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you for watching. I will see y'all next time.